Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by Boxing Hall of Famer Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. How you doing? You look like you just got your daily haircut. Um, it looks <laughs> good. Go. I mean, you, you always Thank look you. good. You look groomed up and great, uh, as always. It's it's nice having your own barber. I always, I always dreamed of a day where I might have my own bubble. I was actually expecting to see you with the glasses and the nose and the fake mustache in disguise. You're in witness protection program after last week's show, aren't you? <laughs> I, I did, I did good last week. Uh, last <laughs> week I did good. It was a couple of weeks ago when I had Ariola thinking he wasn't going to do good. When I, I had to hide out a little bit from, uh, from. But this week. I'm coming off a couple of good weeks uh, in a row, uh, doing pretty good. All, all my fans up there and uh, across the pond too, all our fans <laughs> across the pond, our, our beautiful brothers and sisters that we love over there. You know, I, I know they're sending their apologies for getting on me about, you know, saying that Saunders had no chance at all with Canelo. I know that they're, like they say, they're, they're, I know their apologies are on the way. You know, it takes time to go, you know, transcontinental. It does. It takes a while, you know, for the messages to get to me. Uh, but like they say about the checks, they're in the mail. They're in the mail. <laughs> I, I love you guys. Love I this. think that they're, they're, they're bit, judging by the comments we got on YouTube and uh, social media, I think they're much more upset with the fact that um, with our take on Saunders not answering the bell in between rounds. I think they're very upset that we pointed out only what we saw. Yeah, well, not only what we saw, and and, and you're right, Ken. Uh, we're, we're telling the truth. We're not going down uh, Easy Street. We don't go down Easy Street. We, we we go down Hard Street. We go down the streets that are called to go down. We We don't avoid things. I mean, we're the first ones to point out uh, that I understand, you know, your health comes first. I understand it. I understand fractured uh, orbital bones, how serious that is. I understand that. And now you could Im impair his health down the road and you, you stay in a corner if you want. But I also understand what you're pointing out that there's been fighters in this great sport that have had the same thing. In a way, that wasn't that long ago. The great Japanese fighter, the great world champion, uh, several division weight classes already, undefeated. He's tremendous in a way. He had fractured orbital bones with Donaire, and, and and he went on. But I'm, I'm not saying this for everybody. I'm I'm not saying uh, that there's not a risk that I that I don't understand that it's health before wealth and all that stuff and all those you know sayings that you could throw around that you don't have to come out that that it, it was a injury that. Uh, you can make a decision to stay there. I get it. I'm just pointing out that in this sport, this terribly difficult sport of whether it's UFC, whether it's MMA, you know, UFC, uh, boxing, that these are warriors. And there's a warrior mentality. And sometimes the warrior mentality, you know, don't give a crap about an orbital bone. And I get it. I understand that it's real and that you're going to get. I'm repeating myself. You could do freaking damage. I get it. But I also get that we're pointing out the truth that there have been the fighters, fighters like Carmen Basilio, who fought with one freaking eye like the Cyclops against the greatest fighter of all time, Sugar Ray Robinson, for rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds. Who knows what was broken in his eye? Back in those days when they didn't even, you know, have uh, the the medicine they have today and the the ability to to X-ray right away and to do MRIs and everything. Who knows? And we know Ali had a broken jaw. The it was going like that against Ken Norton in the first fight, and he fought ten rounds with it. Everyone don't have to be Basilio. Everyone don't have to be in a way. Everyone don't have to be Ali. I understand. We're just pointing it out. We're not knocking the guy. But having said all of that, you and Rob made sure that we had that quote, that quote from the man himself, from Saunders. And you could read it again, Ken. 
And when you say those words, when you say something that hard, you know, that serious, right? That real about somebody else who did not go on in a fight because of an injury. When you say the things that Billy Joel Sanders, okay, that he said, and that he said he would never behave that way, that he would die first. Well, when you do that, and then you go and you stay in the corner and you don't come out, it makes, it puts a little bit of a light on yourself. We didn't put that light on you. We're just doing our job and letting people know that these words were spoken by you. These thoughts were spoken by you. There's, there's a attack on that other man's integrity was put forward by you when you talked about that fighter who decided not to come out in his fight late in the fight when he was ahead in the fight. You're the one who put that on yourself. We didn't put that on you. Read that quote again. His exact quote were, um, he told the zones Ak and Barak on their show, if my two eye sockets were broken, my jaw was broken, my teeth were out, my nose was smashed, my brain was beaten, I was not stopping until I was knocked out or worse. I don't agree with a man taking a knee and letting the ref count him out. And I would say that maybe if people took this as a personal jab, we don't have a personal problem with anybody. But if someone's going to say something like that to Daniel Dubois and then the first shot he gets hit with, I, look at, I'm not a fighter. I, I don't want to get punched in the face. I don't want a broken orbital bone. But I'm telling you, if you're going to say these things and then get in there in a pro fight and the first shot, you don't even want to go one more round to see if it's possible to overcome it. You invited these criticisms on yourself. I, I, I don't know why people have a problem with us for pointing out, hey, he said these things. Soon as that same exact scenario happened to him, he chose to... I, I, I now see what Daniel Dubois was going through. It's too much for me. I've had enough. No big deal. No, so that's it. <laughs> that's all we're doing. We're doing our job. And um, I think we do it fairly well. And thank God for the people out there who agree with us and, um, and support us in, to the extent that we've grown quite a bit uh, to our audience here. And we're very, we're very appreciative of that. And if people disagree, that's your right. Come on, come on, disagree. We, we welcome you all, and you're all part of it because there's plenty of you out there that agree with us, plenty that don't agree, but you're all here for a reason. I think it's because you trust that we're going to tell you what we feel and we're going to tell you it, the truth. Um, the truth from the way that we see it and also from the experience, the experience that I have that can attach to my perspective and to my judgment in such things uh, in the 45 years that I've been in this very tough business. It's a very tough business, you know, and um, the fighters understand that risk going in. They understand that. And again, we, we don't in any way knock a fighter we don't knock billy joel for you know sitting in his corner we're just pointing out that they're all there are alternatives and those alternatives have been taken by other fighters we're not saying they're the right alternative but for those fighters they were it was part of it became part of their legacy you know it became it was important to them to adhere to that code of behavior as a fighter. And, and for them, for them. Yep. Uh, anyway, uh, listen, we love you out there. We love you guys across the pond, really. Uh, you know, and come on, keep coming. Don't worry about it. Don't. <laughs> I know you're upset. You're upset about Billy Joe disappointed you in other ways. Uh, not just that, but, you know, he wasn't going to win that fight. And you guys are smart enough to know that. And you're a little disappointed in that. Um, but you got Josh Taylor with a big fight coming up. We'll talk about that a little Ooh. later. Right? You got a big you got a Ooh. big one. You, can, you get back. You get right back in the saddle, guys. You redeem yourselves. Right? Oh, by the way, 
I think Ramirez is going to beat him. We'll talk about that later. We'll talk <laughs> about that a li- little later. Did I say that? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. Well, are you guys having tea and crumpets right now? I'm sorry. Did I <laughs> did, did I upset your lunch? Did I? Uh, uh, no. Forget I said that Ramirez. I, I didn't say Ramirez is going to beat Taylor. <laughs> I'm just, it's going to be a hell of a fight. It's going to be a hell of a fight. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. And no matter what happens, no matter what happens, remember me and Ken love you. Remember that. Okay, and remember that you always have snooker and dots. All right, L- <laughs> I love you guys. Let's get going, Ken. Let's go, baby. Teddy, you know I have to go to London for the London Marathon on October third. Oh. Someone's gonna, someone's oh. gonna oh. kill me while I'm over there. Uh, security, please. <laughs> security, please, please escort I've this already man. Got it arra- uh, I've please. already got it arranged. I'm gonna bring Audley Harrison with me to protect me. Uh, uh, hey, oh, yes. uh, listen. In, in summary, it's not personal. We're just pointing out what happened. I see some people were super offended. Just, dude, relax. We're just giving. We're just pointing out what we saw. It's not a personal thing. I hope Billy Joe Saunders gets better, comes back. All the best to him. Let's talk about the UFC 262 awesome night of competition i think the biggest underdog on the card i may be wrong but i think what i remember is they said it was a plus 75 underdog a woman's fight and the woman won the fight but the point i'm making is fights were even right across the board all the big all the big fights were as close to even as you could get relatively speaking and we'll get into the taylor ramirez fight just hey, let me context. just let me just jump one real quick second since we're yep. talking about handicapping we're talking about lines we're talking about you know betting and all that stuff i am in las vegas i uh, came out of here to visit my son and my grandson and my daughter-in-law came with the whole family with my other two grandchildren my daughter my son-in-law we're, we're having a great time seeing them. we're doing a podcast from here and here in the studio we have well the best man there is really in the country at handicapping and you know, all the stuff that we talk about with my bookie and everything else. We have Bill Krakenberger. He's here in the studio with us right now, sitting right there. The next crack to me, man. Matter of fact. The oh, crack man. Oh, crack man. Yeah. It doesn't Welcome get to any the show, than that. crack. Yeah, don't. don't tell my bookie that cracks here. He's gonna they're gonna kick us they're gonna kick us off the platform if they know we got an edge. <laughs> <laughs> that that book limits me to like fifty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> they know. Uh, yeah, they do they know. know. They do know. They know who the man is. <laughs> they know who the man is. And they know that we got the man with us. That's right. They know that. <laughs> Looking at that fight, Ted, you can actually take 230 here in town now. Ramirez. You hear this, Plus Ken? 230. Yeah. Oh, so well, that's what I was getting wow. at. At wow. the odds on the UFC, they didn't have any 2-1 to one underdogs. And in that Ramirez-Taylor fight, which I think is really close, it's one of the biggest fights for me of the whole year. I'm surprised it's wow. not getting more press. But the line on that one is minus 260 on Josh Taylor, plus 210 on Ramirez. That's a close fight. Wow. I think at plus 210. We'll get into that in a minute. I don't want to well, get I mean, ahead that, of I, I'm, Listen, I disagree. It's not a close fight. They, they got... They got Ramirez a two to one underdog. I mean, yeah, I think they're wrong. To, I, I do. I well, that's what you meant by it. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I think it's a closer fight than that. You're right. I I, yep. I I took what you said the wrong way. Um, yeah, I I think that it's a, a live dog. It's a like Bill that's says, it. it's a live dog. So it's we're gonna make sure dog. we get our action in before we post this episode. By the way. So when uh, you see yeah. it at even money, you'll know that Crack's already on Ramirez. Well, you know the Crack <laughs> man, uh, you know, he, he showed his presence. You know what I mean? They, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Hey, guys, quick break to give a shout out to today's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Brave, the privacy browser. We've discussed it before. Other, bri- other browsers don't respect your privacy. Brave is different. They've built better privacy into a much faster browser. Three times faster than Chrome with a much better layout and experience. Brave automatically blocks big text trackers and intrusive ads that slow you down, drain your battery, and track you from site to site and hit you with those creepy ads that follow you around the web. I'm sure we've all experienced it. You're having a conversation about uh, bed sheets, and the next thing you know, you're getting ads for uh, some bed sheet manufacturer. You know what I'm talking about. With Brave, no one, including Brave, sees what you're doing online. So head over to brave.com slash atlas and join 30 million people who've upgraded their privacy browser for free. No charge whatsoever. Again, you can download it and use it for free. Switch in under 60 seconds by going to brave.com slash atlas. Well, let's talk uh, UFC 262. Let's start with Edson Barboza and Shane Burgos. 
This was an awesome fight, all action, but really what stuck out for a lot of people, myself included, was the delayed reaction to the knockout by Barboza. Barboza hit Burgos with, a, uh, I believe, a left a left uh, uh, jab or an uppercut, one or the other, and then an overhand right that clipped him on the top of the temple, and Burgos bounced on his toes, stood right in front of him, and I've never seen such a delay in a knockout, and then he just slowly started fading backwards like he was fainting, and then crashed down against the fence. Unfortunately, uh, Barboza did what he was supposed to do, jumped on him, and landed a few more big shots before the ref was able to pull him off, pull him off. but um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. I've never seen someone get that... Uh, with a body shot, I've seen a delayed reaction like that, but never with a head shot where the guy engages again and then slowly just kind of goes out, more or less. What'd you think? Yeah, <clears throat> it's more common with the body shots where, <clears throat> excuse me, where you see a guy caught in the liver for the most part. You see a guy caught that left hook to the liver like Mickey Ward used to deliver uh, so effectively. Wow. And and the guy would take a step back, you know, he'd be uh, up, and then he'd drop to a knee. And uh, you see that delayed reaction, almost like uh, it takes a certain amount of time uh, for the the that effect of that blow to be sent uh, to the area where you know suddenly uh, you know you can't stand anymore. You know, it's like. That's the reason for the delayed reaction, is that it it does take a, a second, second and a half, uh, for the just for that to be sent to that part of the body, uh, where suddenly you have that impact um, right there, you know, a half a second, second and a half later, and to your point, Ken, that you see it much more common in the body. And this will give the people, our great fans out there, something to look forward to. Is that uh, we just did an interview, a tremendous interview. I think people are going to love it with Dustin Poirier in his camp. I mean, how special is that? That he allows us to do an interview while he's in camp for the rematch with McGregor. It's going to be up Thursday, so it'll be up later in, uh, in this week. And we speak about that. And again, I think people will definitely want to hear the take that that Dustin, a fighter and a warrior, has has on the delay reaction and have whether or not he's seen that before. Um, but for me, I told Rob, our great producer here and our partner here and our friend here, I told him, listen, tee up, and, and he's gonna, tee up some where people aren't as aware that there have been delayed knockdowns uh with punches to the head to the chin to the you know to the head area uh and so we have a few of them that rob's going to tee up for you and you're going to see that this is not a first time that this has happened it's a phenomena there's a phenomena and it's really something for someone to see for the first but it's happened before the one that strikes out for me or sticks out for me right away is tyson trevor burbert ken because Tyson, when he won his first belt, you know, he hits Trevor Burbick with that sweeping left hook, whap, right across the forehead, and it catches him on the temple. And Burbick stands there frozen in time for, for like a full count, like, boom, he gets hit the hook, whap, it goes right through past his head, and he, he freezes there, boom, and then he drops. And so there is a precedent uh, for these type, uh, knockdowns and knockouts. Uh, Burbick tried to get up. He toppled this way. He toppled that way. Pernell Whitaker's another one. You don't think of Pernell Whitaker as a great puncher. Great, great boxer. Great magician. Uh, you know, in the ring as far as disappearing on you. Uh, great defensive, elusive fighter. But you don't think of him as a puncher, but another one of the clips I told Rob to put up, he fought Nazario, or Nazaro, I believe it was, uh, way back. I forget what year it was. And he catches him, catches him a shot he doesn't see coming in. And the same thing. Nazaro froze for a second, he was there, and then, boom, he's gone. So I've seen him before in my business. Uh, it, it really is shocking to see it really does you know shock the system you see you say oh my god 
Look at that. The guy, he's, he's like walking back. He's okay, like you described it beautifully. He's bouncing around. He's ready to go, and then all of a sudden he's gone. You know, it's kind of like I don't want to get too, you know, graphic or, or serious here, but it's part of life. Uh, you see sometimes, you know, where you you hear about or see a video, unfortunately, or maybe you're just a reenactment on TV of a guy getting shot on the street, and he'll go, he'll go a few steps. You know, he'll keep going a few steps. And then all of a sudden, of course, he'll drop, where it's almost like the, the mind was preordained to what it was going to do. The mind is so powerful. It was preordained to what it was going to do, and it was already set in motion. So it keeps doing it, and then, of course, the body says no. And it, you know, obviously it drops. And my explanation for it is along those lines, for the phenomena of that, from being in this business. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biochemist. I'm not a biologist. I'm not any of those things. I don't pretend to be. I'm just a boxing guy. I painted one house, by the way, uh, when I was young. Uh, other than that, that's about it. Uh, <laughs> boxing's for my life. Um, and... The explanation I would give it is when it comes to the body, it takes a little while to travel to get to its destination and then all of a sudden you get the delayed reaction. When it comes to the head, a combination of the two things that the signal is sent. You know, you're, 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 you're hitting the nervous system, especially the, the chin. You know, there's an electric current sent. I don't think I'm uh, being shocking too many people that I know that little tiny bit, you know, that this basically I'm doing it obviously in very primitive terms and very layman terms, but basically there's electronic current sent to send a signal, you know, from your brain to, you know, from your body to your brain. And, um, and sometimes that signal gets interrupted. Uh, you know, you get hit on the chin, that signal uh, can be interrupted. So the signal... Here you are where a signal's being sent, it's on its way, and it it takes a there's a certain delay and to get to basically to the message center, if you will, to the central command center. I think that's the, the most basic way I could explain it. And there's another component here, there's another thing at work here for for me. Fighters just like the MMA fighters, these warriors Ken, they are so they are so pre programmed in their minds, kind of like the Android in the movie, you know, the Terminator. There's a chip. And that chip that's been put in there is to tell it to complete its mission no matter what. Complete your freaking mission no matter what. Now I know we're not androids. We're human beings. But it's a complex machinery. The, the human body. It's, it's a, obviously, it's, it's a miracle. It's, it's amazing. But the mind is amazing, how powerful the mind is. That's why you see the greatest champions have the strongest minds, the strongest wills. They do things they weren't supposed to do. Yeah, that's simple. They find a way when they weren't supposed to find a way. And how do they do that? They're so set in their mind that I will not relent. I will not give in. I will not submit. I will not be conquered. It is so pre-registered in your head, in your mind, in your spirit, in your will, in your makeup, in your conscience, in your subconscious, that when you get caught, your mind is still adhering to that programmed, registered command that's been put in there for years of training where I must find a way. I must go on. I must get past this. I must not stop. I must get through the fire. So the mind allows the body to keep going, kind of like dead man walking. I hate to use such graphics, such a, but, but I'm getting to the point. You, 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 you know, you've been damaged, but yet the mind is so powerful and it's been so preset, preordained into you, pre- you know, pre-committed into your mind, into your brain, into your being, 
that you continue on for a second or two before the body shuts down. That's what it is. That's the phenomena for me. For me, just being, a, again, I'm not pretending to be a biochemist or, you know, some kind of neutron expert, you know, or anything like that. I'm just Teddy Atlas, a guy who's been in a fight game over my whole life. But I know how people, I know there's got to be an explanation for how certain people do certain things. Things that aren't supposed to be done. Yeah, things that aren't. I know fighters that have been dropped, Ken. I've been with them. Where they've been dropped in a fight. We talked about this on a prior podcast. Where they've been dropped. And they get up. They finish the fight. They win the fight. And then... Somebody say to him, you know, when you, when you were dropped, did you recover right? You know, how'd you feel with it? What are you talking about? No, you know, when you got dropped in the third round and you got, what are you, what are you talking about? I didn't get dropped. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah. I, I've, been, I've been there. I've been there. What's the explanation for that? What's the, they leapfrog past it. They leapfrog past it because their mind was so strong that they were fighting. They were basically out on their feet. They were out on their feet, but they kept fighting because they, they don't remember being dropped. They don't even remember that part of the fight. Yet they went on and they won the fight because their mentality was so strong. The, 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 the program was there, the chip. The program was there to go on, and they found a way to free. They got a short circuit there, kind of like when you're at home and, you know, the light, you're flickering on and off with the, with, the, with the cable, and the light's flickering on and off. It's not off. It's not fully on, but it's not fully off. It's, it's flickering on and off. That's what's happening. Again, I know I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be called by a, the, the community of scientists tomorrow and they're going to want to go over this this um, this theory with, uh, with Dr. Atlas. We should have one of Rob's clients on here, uh, Andrew Huberman, world-renowned neuroscientist um, yes. at Stanford. And uh, yeah. this is all he talks about is how the brand, brain functions, et cetera, et cetera. But and, and he's a huge MMA fan and a world-class person. But Andrew Huberman would be a great person to have on to describe how these things happen and why they happen. Yeah, and they happen. And he would be a great guy. And we'll have him yeah. on maybe someday. Yeah. You, you know. Really good, uh, dude. But this... That, that uh, I've seen guys where, I've seen guys knocked out. I mean, people, you, people out there, you could Google this. They're, they're, it's out there. Some of it you might not want to see. It's disturbing. But where I've seen guys knocked out, they're laying on the canvas, and they're still throwing punches. You ever see that, Ken? I've seen Oh, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. Where they're out. And their mind, their mind is like, I got to keep punching. I mean, they're gone. The body's gone, obviously. But they're laying on the floor. And they're still throwing punches. It's just that the guys we're talking about, they find a way to, to avoid even going to the floor. They find a way to, again, catapult over that, to jump all past that, you know? And um, I, uh, so anyway, that's, that's, we saw that. We saw that uh, the late knockdown. It's quite a thing to see. It got a lot of attention, um, and that's my take. Well, Andrew Huberman, if you're listening, we need you on the show ASAP to give us some uh, give us some technical terms for what happened. Um, good win for Edson Barboza. Next up, we had Tony Ferguson and Deni- Benil Dariush. Uh, Tony Ferguson always entertaining. Gave a lot of quotes during the a lot of quality quotes during the week per usual. Um, very entertaining fight. Uh, Darius just gets it done, dominant in dominant fashion. Beat him up pretty good for all three rounds and um, gets the win. Not sure where Tony goes from here. He's um, I feel like Tony and I really like him, but I feel like we saw him get old in like one or two fights, and now. You know, since Charles Oliveira really put it on him pretty good, and now Darius just putting it on him, I, I just don't know where Tony goes from here. I don't know how he continues to be competitive in that division because the top guys are just putting it on him. What do you think? You know, I talk about this uh, always over the years <coughs> on ESPN and now on our podcast. Uh, he's got a 
Ferguson's got a lot of miles on his odometer. You don't judge a fight as, I don't care if it's in the octagon, I don't care if it's in the squared circle, you do not judge a fighter's age chronologically. Not in my book. And not in a sport, you don't. You judge it by the amount of tough fights they've been in, the amount of punches they've taken. And Ferguson's been in a lot of tough fights. He's got a lot of miles on the old domino. And it's, you know, he's 37 years old and it shows. Um, those miles show. Uh, he's a, first of all, I want to applaud him for the man he is. I want to, what, what we do, do, what we start this show with, talking about uh, Saunders. And I'm not minimizing this. I'm not demeaning him. I made that clear, okay? Did you hear me? I made it clear, okay, you guys? I know I got to yell you across the pond. I get it. So I got to yell a little louder so you hear me. But I understand. But here's the guy also. He made a choice. These guys make choices. They made a choice to be a fighter. They're not in opera. They're, they're not in opera. They're not in figure skating. They're not all great sports, all great uh, vocations. Don't get me wrong. But I love opera, you know, hearing opera and stuff. I only hear it for the most part if I go to Ken's because he's got his own, you know, he's, he's got his own little studio there where, you know, he, he used to bring Bocelli in to, uh, to sing uh, to the family. Andrea Bocelli. Yeah, Bocelli. I'm sorry. I pronounced it wrong. He used to bring him in, you know, to do certain you know, kids parties and stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, but it's your choice of the business you choose, right? It's not personal, people. It's it's business, and I'm doing the business of pointing it out. And you make a choice to be in this tough sport, then a certain mode of behavior goes along with it, and. Here's Ferguson at 37 years of age. He's on the floor in a leg lock. Or, uh, I don't know the technical term, but I'm probably close, right? Leg lock. Yep. Right? Okay, thank you. And Torque in the ankle, which puts oh huge God, pressure on Ken, the knee. And Darius, Darius is an expert down there on the mat. He's in his, oh yeah, black he's in his turf, right? He's in his territory. And he's got him in his leg, and he's going to break his leg. He's going to tear the leg up. And he and Darius told you after the fight. I heard it pop. I heard it pop. I say it again. Did you hear me over there in London? Hello. It popped. It popped. And what did he do? Again. He might never walk again. It probably would have been good to tap out and submit. To my point at the beginning. Yeah, I'm going to point it out. It probably made sense to tap out right there. But his code, his code of behavior, honor, warrior's code, whatever. No, no, I chose this business. I will behave the way you need to behave in this business since I chose this business. And what did he do? He stayed there. He kicked his way out. But who knows what his leg looks like or feels like now. It can't be good. Again, I'll repeat it. Dario said, yeah, I heard it pop. I heard stuff pop. <laughs> I heard, please, let the kids go to bed. I heard stuff pop, okay? And, and he stayed there. I tweeted out. My man, Rob, got it right up there. We got a lot of responses. Oh, my goodness. Ken, we forget about it. I tweeted <laughs> out. I I tweeted out that Webster's Dictionary should now put a picture of Ferguson up in where they have for the definition of toughness. Remove the definition. Save some words. You need more space anyway. There's no new words coming out all the time. You need a little more room. Wipe out the words and just put a picture of Ferguson for tough. That's it. That's all you have to do because that's what it is. That's the warrior's code. That's it. Right there, okay? How's the tea and Trump, uh, what do they call them, crumpets? Or? Crumpets. 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 How's the tea and crumpets going over there, guys? <laughs> going, going good? Going good? Nice? All right. Okay, do you put <laughs> butter on your crumpets or do you eat them plain? I like crumpets with butter on mine. I, 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 I like my crumpets with a little butter, you know? I, I, I'm thinking of Joe Pesci now in My Cousin Vinny. When, when he was down south, they getting those kids out of trouble. He's down south. And he said, uh, how do you like your grits? <laughs> how do you like your grits? You like your grits, uh, you know, well done, or you, you like them al dente? They're looking at him, a guy from New York, al dente. Uh, what's al dente uh, uh, grits? What's al dente grits? 
Uh, I like my crumpets al dente. But again, he, Ferguson, went out on the shield. We have sayings, Ken, and he, every once in a while you see truth put to the, you know, you hear about power to words, right? You hear that, you say, yeah, that's power to words. Well, that was power to a saying going out on your shield. You hear that saying all the time, but you say, did I ever really see a guy go out on a shield? You know, well, guess what? You did. You saw Ferguson go on his freaking shield. And I always say, those fights are about geography. So put aside how old Ferguson and how shop one he might be and everything else. To the credit of Darius, he got to the geography that served his talents best. He got to the floor. He got to the mat. That, that's, that, he won the battle of geography. And that, that led to him winning the fight. That led to him winning the fight. And early on, you could see the plan of Darius. I'm going to get in close. I'm going to come after him. And I'm going to get him to the floor. And he did. And I'll take what I got to take. He walked in. I don't know if everyone saw this. He walked in that first round. He walked in pushing Ferguson back. And he walked into some counters. Ferguson tried his damnedest. He landed a couple counter punches. The problem was right on the chin. The problem was his feet were moving back, so he couldn't set himself to get real power. And Darius, well, he walked right through him. I mean, he walked through him like a rhinoceros walks through a rainstorm. Like you know, <laughs> he, he he just he he just he he just charged right through them. And then he got close, and he you know he went for the takedown. He got him again. He got to the territory, to the geography that he needed to get to, and he dominated, dominated. Give him credit. Great job by Darius. Great job of behavior and conduct uh, by Ferguson. Uh, to behave the way he behaved too, and um, to honor himself, uh, even in defeat, uh, the way he did. I I, I just want to I just want to point that out, uh, you know, that. And again, uh, Ferguson early on he tried his best. He tried to catch him counter, and he did. He caught him, caught him coming in early, but no no uh, no effect, and. Uh, once it got to the floor, that was so you could see Darius is uh, pretty comfortable in that place. Yeah, congratulations to Benil Darius. Curious to see where he goes from here. Look for big things in the future. Brings us to the main event, Teddy um, Charles Oliveira, Michael Chandler. What an awesome fight for the, for the four. The amount of time it lasted. Um, looked like Charles Oliveira early in the first was going to dominate. Uh, Chandler, per usual, came out a frenetic pace, like a ball of energy unloading from everywhere. Oliveira weathered the storm, got the takeout, took his back, got him in a body triangle, had him, and looks like in a lot of trouble. And Charles Oliveira is a killer on the ground, and black black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He looked awesome. But credit to Chandler, he withstood it, battled back, all-American wrestler, I believe, from Missouri. Uh, he got up, and he landed a bomb right on Oliveira's chin, dropped him. And to Oliveira's credit, where in the past he might have submitted there or you know taking a step back and like taking a loss this time he went on autopilot kept moving his head from the ground kept dodging punches You're stealing my thunder there because i mentioned that in a poirier <laughs> fight uh in, in a poirier interview you still my thunder you weren't gonna say he moved his head you were just gonna say he got up he found a way to get up he found a way to will himself not to submit but that was the key to the fight that was the and key he to the up fight. And that ended the fight the in the second round with the bomb. Take it away. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. No, that was the key. No, it's okay. That was the, hey, I, you're, you're my guy. I let you steal it. Someone else, no. Um, but you're my guy. And uh, listen, that was the fight. I'm going to, you're forcing me to kind of uh, jump at the end to the beginning because I want to cover that now. I was going to, Take it step by step. I will go back and retrace my steps in a second for you great fans out there. But to the fans out there, listen, I don't think anybody mentioned this that night at all. And you got the greatest commentators out there. You do. They are the best. DC, Rogan, and John um, 
Anik. Anik. I mean, they're, they're, they're second to none. They really are. They make the... They make it a more enjoyable experience watching, listening to real experts and people that know what the freak they're doing. This fight was won and lost, won by, won by Oliveira because of what he did. When he was on the ground, he got dropped, and he got hurt, and he was on the ground. A lot of people thought the referee could have stopped it. No. The referee was the right referee that he didn't stop it. Sometimes you might get a referee that would have stopped it too soon. It would have been too bad. You never would have known what we know now. And he would have been, Oliveira would have been robbed of an opportunity to be a champion. Uh, it's for his resolve and his instincts, his experience to have won the fight for him, for his great determination to have paid dividends for him. Um, you don't close the door on that stuff. So your referee, it's, a, it's walking a tightrope, not too soon, not too late. I get it. I get it. It's a big responsibility, but it's a responsibility that's supposed to be done the right way. And this referee did it the right way. And I'll tell you the whole fight, guys. I know we could talk about three different elements, four different elements in this fight, but this is where it starts and stops for me. When he did get dropped, you know, he had been hurt by the left hook, then he got hurt and dropped by the right hand on the side of the head that can do a lot of damage. And he goes down and he's on his knees and here comes the finishing blows. And they were going to be the finishing blows. And they usually are. Big, big shots coming, raining down on him. What does he do? He can't even see them coming because his head's down, he's on his knees, he's on his hands, on all fours. And, but he knows what's coming from his experience. He knows from his experience. His instinct tells him to do what? Move your effing head. Move your freaking head. I mean freaking when I say effing. I never curse on this, on this podcast. I try to take pride and responsibility in that. And uh, even though we could, uh, I think the two of us take pride in that, that we don't. Uh, we have kids listening to stuff. He moved his freaking head, okay? He... Those big punches, that right hand, left hands that were coming, that were just like, like meteors attacking the earth, they were coming right for his skull, and he moved his head like this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Didn't see them coming, no, no, but he knew what would be coming. He's a fighter. He knew I'm hurt. That guy's going to finish me. He moved his head, and he avoided two or three game ending punches fight ending punches nobody talked about this fight ending punch. right there and then he survived he backed up against the, the cage survived a little bit more survived a little bit more he got up to his feet he he finished the round he lost the round I think, Ken, you pointed out when we were talking to Dustin that one, at least one of the judges, I didn't know this, one of the judges had it at 10-8. One or two. I think you might have said two of the two. Two had it 10-8, one had it 10-9. And again, Oliveira dominated most of the uh, round, but Chandler clipped him, dropped him, and had him hurt there. So two of the three judges scored a 10-8. Yeah. And, Personally, I thought 10-9 was the right score yeah, given the domination it, from Oliveira. Yeah. And he goes, what does he do? He gets up, he survives the round, and then he comes back. Of course, we're going to talk about what he did in the second round. But that's the fight right there. He doesn't move his head instinctively, innately. He doesn't do that. The fight's over. The fight's over. Chandler is the man that we're talking about right now. Chandler becomes the man who's going to fight Por the winner of Poirier and McGregor uh, next instead of it being Oliveira. And um, but give credit to Oliveira for all the things we talk about, all the things we we talked about earlier, about that mental toughness, about the code of conduct, the code of behavior, a warrior's code, really. Yeah, I'm going back to Billy Joe Saunders again. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, you know, uh, I hope. I mean, did you finish your tea and crumpets? I mean. Did you finish your tea yet? Do you have Ken? Give them some more hot water because uh, <laughs> they're going to be with us for a little while here. I, I, my beautiful people over there that we love over there in London. Um, but 
you know, again, Saunders, I know he had a serious thing uh, with his orbital bones, but he made a choice not to go on. These guys make choices, whether it's a smart choice or not, from a physical standpoint, from a future standpoint. They make those choices. That's their, that's their attitude. There, there's no retreat. There's no surrender. They, they, they couldn't be this if, if that was allowed into their, into their minds, into that area. It, it's not allowed. It's not allowed. And so anyway, he survives real smart, moves his head, instinctively survives. Now let's go to the beginning that you beautifully touched on uh, at the outset of this fight. First of all, Oliveira, tremendous jiu-jitsu, the whole background. Uh, he gets the geography he wants. He gets Chandler, looks like he's going to probably win a fight. Uh, he's, he's, he's got him on the floor, on the mat. And what does Chandler do with brute force? I mean, just brute force. I, I mean, this guy is so strong. And he showed it. I mean, he showed it right there. He gets up. He gets, he, he's, as you said, he's being dominated. The geography, which is so important of the, of the ring, of the cage, belongs to Oliveira where he can serve his talents best on the floor, on the mat. And, and he just wills his way, physically and mentally wills his way, Chandler, to getting up to breaking out of it. And then he turns the tables and he earns that 10-8 round, as you just talked about. Oliveira, and it always comes down to breaking rules. Rules of physics, rules of life, rules of boxing. For me, physic rules in the ring that you teach. Just like rules out in the street, out in life. You don't go through a red light. You go through a red light, you get a ticket, you might get hit by a car. In the UFC, you probably get hit by a truck. Okay? Uh, those are the rules. You, you break rules in the ring, you break rules in life, there's a penalty to, play, to pay. And for me, the rules, the laws, you don't go straight back. That's one of them. That's one of them. Anytime you see a guy get hit, there's a reason. The guy didn't get lucky. There's a reason. The guy made a mistake. He did something wrong. You could break it down to that just about all the time. You go straight back. How many times have I talked about this, Ken, where you can't, you and Jim with me, you understand. I'm not going to let a guy go straight back. You can't <laughs> nope. go straight back. You go, if, if, a, if you were on a train track and the train was coming, would you go straight back? No. <laughs> oh, I'm going to run away from the train. Guess what? The train's faster than you. It's going to catch you. You're still on the damn track. Okay, dopey? You're still on the track. Get off the track. Get off the track. So what happens is you could go back one step from the right distance you could counter, but you can't go back two or three and stay on that track. And Oliveira, tremendous. He is tremendous. He made a mistake, and he went back a couple steps in a row, straight back. And Chandler pursued him. He stepped with him. He did what you're supposed to do. He stepped with him and caught him a left hook. And he hurt him. That's why he hurt him. <laughs> and then he catches him with the right hand on the side of the head, and he drops him. And again, when he's down, he goes to finish him. He goes to finish him. He's going to finish. He's going to close the show. And he goes with those punches and... Oliveira moves his head without even seeing the damn punches. That's what you call eyes in the back of your head. That's what you call eyes in the back. He knew what was going to be coming, so he moved his head, and he survived. And then what happens to the second round? Second round, Oliveira shows his, well, he shows his versatility. He shows his versatility. And to the credit of, to the credit of our friend Dustin, Poirier, who, again, you're going to see his interview in a few days, he, he texted us before the fight. He texted you, and then you forwarded it to me. Before the fight, asking, we had asked him, you had asked him, who does he like in the fight? And he said that, he said that Oliveira had more ways to win. He, he, was, he was right on the button. 
but that he makes mistakes sometimes. He put a butt in there, but sometimes he'll make mistakes. You're not sure, but he's got more ways in the end to win. Well, in the second round, he showed that other way, standing. He showed that other, that, that other dimension, you know, as I talked about, the versatility. And now, again, mistake. Ken, it comes down to a mistake again because what does Chandler do? He's a good striker, really good puncher. He tries to time Oliveira with a right hand. It was really beautiful. It, it just missed. He tried to time Oliveira. It was like, bang. He tried to time Oliveira as Oliveira was throwing. And if he caught him, he would have hurt him. He just missed. And then what do I say about the rules? You were in the gym with me. One of the rules, one of the law. you move your head after your last punch. You don't take a picture. You don't pose. As Costamato would say, you don't wait for the receipt. <laughs> you move. He times the right hand. Instead of moving his head out of the path, out of the middle, what's he do? He comes back right here, steps right back here, right in the middle, and he admires his work. Bang! Left hook catches him. Catches him admiring his work, waiting for his receipt, taking a picture. You choose the saying, whatever. They all lead to the same thing. He gets caught with an unbelievable left hook, and it's good night. You know, it's uh, then all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, uh, defeat. Uh, all of a sudden victory is grabbed out of the drawers of defeat. You know? I mean, uh, all of a sudden you got a guy who lost the first round 10-8 and now all of a sudden he's, he turns the tables around Oliveira and he, he gets this sensational win. He gets the title. It was like Hagler Hearns because Hagler Hearns that first round, oh my goodness, Oh, my goodness, that was something. And it was <laughs> back and forth. And that's what you got. You got that in the first round. The only difference, Hagler Hearns went three rounds of hell. This was two <laughs> rounds, two rounds of at least purgatory. <laughs> uh, but, but, a, but a little hell, a little hell in there. Uh, and it was, it was great. It was tremendous. I, I applaud Chandler. Uh, he made that mistake, and he pays for that mistake. He almost pulled it off, though. He almost pulled it off. Uh, but I, I applaud Oliveira. I applaud them both uh, for everything that they represent. Toughness, determination, resiliency, smarts, instincts, uh, you know, great talent. Oh, boy. It was a good one. It was a good one. We got a lot of hits on our tweets, Ken. A lot of hits on our tweets. I'm a, I'm a Tweety bird. <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a tweeter. I'm a tweeter now with Rob, with the help of Rob. Um, but that's what I saw. Uh, and I'll tell you, another thing it proved, it proved why UFC has surpassed boxing in the ratings game. No, really. It's my sport, boxing. I'm not abandoning you. I'm just doing what we do. I'm telling the truth. It shows why. Because they put competitive fights on. They put tough fights on. They put the best in with the best. There's no layups. There's no free lunch. There's none of that. Everyone gets in the freaking deep end of the pool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, there's no wading pool with Dana. There's no, there's no, you know, cleaning your feet off. No, you get thrown right in the deep end of the freaking pool with Dana White. You know, and and that's why that brand, that's why that sport, that's why that enterprise has grown the way it's grown. Because you're gonna get competitive fights no matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they have two losses, three losses, four losses, five losses, six losses, seven losses, eight losses. These guys learn how to fight. These guys have been battle tested. They've been forged in the fire. And they're able to, on any given night, beat the champion, beat a guy who's undefeated, beat a guy who's got one loss. If they got 10 losses, they could still beat them because of the fire they went through, because of what they've been formed to be. Real, 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 tested, 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 tried and proven warriors. And, you know, sometimes in boxing, 
well, you, 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 the promoter and the manager just wants to get a guy undefeated. And meanwhile, they, they get cheated. They get cheated out of the fight they need along the way to take a deep breath physically and mentally to find out what they, what they are. They need to know that, to know that they can handle that. They can depend on themselves. They could go in that level. They need to know that. They don't get to know that because you're, you're navigating them with, with easy fights to keep them undefeated, to, to get on TV, to get a title. And then someday, someday they fight somebody that they don't have the answers for because they never got the answers. They had talent and they were, they were navigated brilliantly, uh, if you want to call it brilliant, or maybe they were cheated. They weren't given a one or two tough fights that they might have lost. They might have won, but they might have lost. But it will form them into the fighter they need to be, the best they can be. That's what, that's what these UFC guys, they get formed. They have to pay their dues. They get formed. To that end, Oliveira started his career 10 and 8 with one no contest, and he missed weight four or five times, four times in five years. Still kept at it. Now he's the champ. No, uh, really. Started 11 years ago. This, again, I'm, I'm just emphasizing this point, Ken, and I made notes to myself. I mean, here you got, here you got a guy in Chandler, only his second freaking fight. In the UFC, second fight, right? And who does he get put in there with? A guy on an eight fight, what was it, eight fight or nine fight win streak with uh, something with like Oliver. that? He's got the he's got the most finishes after this in the UFC. Eight fights, yeah. My man Rob just told me eight fights. So he puts him in there with a with a monster. I mean. And wow, welcome to the UFC, uh, Mr. Chandler. Hi, I'm Mr. White. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm Mr. White. Yes, uh, come right here. We're glad to have you here. Really happy to have you over here. Okay? Yep, we're going to treat you with the hospitality, hospitality we treat everybody. Um, your next fight, Oliveira. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we, yeah, we, this, uh, you talk about no gloves, no kick gloves treatment. I mean, that that's what you have that's what you have i mean dana white is the original scrooge you know i mean you get coal in your freaking stocking i'm sorry i'm sorry you think you're gonna get like all these little presents that your kids get <laughs> you ain't getting it you ain't getting it yeah you're not getting it yeah no no welcome to the ufc baby you carry your own weight really you better be ready <laughs> you better be freaking ready I mean, could you imagine being invited over to Dana White's barbecue? Really, his <laughs> idea of, of inviting all his new fighters. Hey, guys, yeah, I'd love to have you. want you to feel the love and everything of the UFC, of Dana White's world. Come on over to my house for a barbecue. You get to the house, and you know what he does? He hands you a spear, and he tells you, go ahead, go out into the jungle and get a wild boar. Bring it back, and we'll put it on the spit. <laughs> that, that's, his, that's his idea of a barbecue. No ribeyes. No, no, <laughs> there's no stack of ribeyes that are waiting for you or Kobe steaks that are waiting to be grilled, you know, with gloves on, and you, you're going to flip them. You know, there's none of that here. Here's a spear. There's a jungle. There's, there's a a bunch of wild boar running around in there. Be careful. They have big tusks. You know, be careful. Uh, go go spear, go spear one, carry it back, and we'll put it in the pit. Uh, we'll put it on the spit in the pit. I mean, that's, that's the reality of the UFC. I mean, again, there it is. There's, there's exhibit A right there. Chandler, who, who looked like a beast in his first fight with Hooker, his second fight, yeah, okay, no problem. We, we'll give you another gift. Uh, here it is, Oliveira. So that's, again, that's why the UFC has been doing the numbers they do. That's why they surpass boxing. When it comes to regular fights, I'm not talking about when Fury and Joshua fight the numbers. It's going to be no comparison. I get it. I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about those fights, you know, when, when you get those, you know, those big super fights uh, when boxing does it right. Uh, they're going to get the numbers. They're going to get the real big numbers. I get it. Uh, we, we always have. We get the bigger universe. But when it talks to consistency, to everyday producing, 
Every week you turn on a fight. Too often, too often, too often you turn on on these cable shows and these uh, these that have the regular fights. You you see an A against a B. You 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 know only one guy can win. Uh, you know it's it's sometimes these it's just to build the guy's record to keep to keep him winning. Uh, it's not competitive. At the end of the day, it's not very rarely now. Not enough. Not not enough. I know next week we got a good one. We're going to talk about it with Ta- Taylor and Ramirez. That's a good one. That's a great fight. That's a great fight. And I'm the first one to say it. But it's too few and far between. UFC puts on competitive fights every freaking week. In boxing, there's too many nights, too many weeks where you put on and you say, what, why am I taking the time to watch this? I mean, the the... The outcome was decided when they signed the contract. Yep. Speaking of which, we, um, we've got an awesome fight coming up in boxing. This, um, this one I've been looking forward to, Josh Taylor against Ramirez. Uh, like we said, the odds don't necessarily reflect how close it is. Minus 260 on Taylor, plus 210 on Ramirez. Head over to mybookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS for a th- for 100% credit on your first deposit up to $1,000. Um, I'm dying to hear what you think on this. Let's do. Let's break down the fight, and then we'll come back to it with my bookie and give a prediction for the fight. We got the over under at uh, ten and a half rounds, minus three eighty on the over, plus three hundred on the under. Um, what are you looking for in this one? Taylor coming off big win against our man Regis Progre, split decision, a fight that Taylor probably won a little bit more convincingly, but. Um, I'm dying to see this one. Ramirez obviously been on fire. Beat Hooker. Looking good, California kid. Uh, what do you think? Before I go into that, I just want to say one thing that I left out <coughs> about the Oliveira Chandler fight. Oliveira reminds me the greatest thing about him, uh, he's always balanced, he's always set. Always. And Joe Rogan pointed that out. I, I saw it myself, but Joe Rogan, again, I'm in the habit of actually giving credit to people that say things. I, I just think that's <laughs> the, I think that's the kind of the right way, the right etiquette in life. I do. But as they do a great job. But I, I saw the same thing. And Oliveira, again, with all his versatility, one of his greatest strengths, he's never out of position. He's always balanced to deliver a hard shot. A real solid shot because his legs are always in the right position. His weight's always in the right position, in the right place. He reminds me of Inouye. I've said this before with other fighters. Inouye's a good example for me. The great Japanese fighter who is already, he's undefeated. He's already won at different weight classes uh, in boxing. If, he reminds me of Inouye. Inouye, they call him the monster over in, in Japan, and he is a monster. He, he's always balanced. He's he's never out of he's never out of position, and he's always balanced. Everything he throws, he's in position to throw it hard. Like Tyson used to say, "Bad intentions," you know, <laughs> and and that's Oliveira from to me that he's always in position to throw a really really. Telling punch, uh, I mean, a, a destructive punch. So now, let's get to Josh Taylor, uh, Southpaw, against Jose Ramirez, orthodox fighter. Both undefeated. Neither one has learned how to lose. I'm surprised, to your point, Ken. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that this line is uh, as big as it is. I am. I'm a little surprised. I think I know the reason. But I'm, well, obviously, the bookmakers think that Taylor's a lot better, that he's going to win. But, and... Uh, and, and listen, you, our fans over there, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about you guys. And now, you know, you have a chance to get redemption because Billy Joel, yeah, he disappointed you guys, you know. And he did, whatever you call it. And now Josh Taylor will, will you know, he'll, he'll bring it back for you. He'll bring it back for you. Okay, so this is what I think. I think it's going to be a terrific fight. I think the styles make fights. Uh, both these styles, uh, they speak to a great fight. They yell, they bark to a great fight. That it should be terrific. Uh, I, it's 
for all the belts, right, Ken? It's for all the belts, I believe. All to of unify. them. To yep. unify. Yep. All, all of them. That four matter. belts. Yep. All that matter. Four belts. And uh, and the ring magazine. The, okay. So all five. All, all, all of that stuff. Whatever. Um, and I think coming off of what you just touched on, where. Taylor's coming off a hell of a win against Pro Grace. Good competitive majority decision. I thought he won, but majority decision win. Now, Taylor's style is that he can box on the outside. He's a southpaw. Uh, that's going to give another dimension for Ramirez to overcome. He's a southpaw. He can box on the outside, but he's a guy that can go in the trenches too. The son of a gun. He could go in the trenches too. He knows how to put water in the basement too and go to the body, as I always would say on ESPN over the years. And I say here now, uh, he he could do either way. He's comfortable inside or outside. Uh, Ramirez is known more for wanting to be in the trenches. He wants to get in, wants to put water in your basement, go to the body, break it down, bring relentless pressure. But don't sleep on him. I've seen in his last few fights, he's gotten better. His trainer's doing a good job. He's gotten better at using his jab and being able to do things on the outside to, to stabilize guys that want to box with him. You want to box with Ramirez. You don't want him to get close. You want to counter punch. You want to keep him outside. You don't want him to get into your kitchen. You, you want to be able to make him pay a price for the real estate he's trying to earn getting close to you. That's how you want to fight Ramirez. Ramirez don't make it so easy anymore. <laughs> he uses his jab pretty damn well where he can nullify some of that. He can negate some of that. He can take some of that away. He can, he can stabilize a boxer on the outside with his jab. So he's, he's got a better, in that area, he's better than, than the bookmakers are looking at it right now. And I see my man Krakenberger because he's the top guy in Vegas. He's the man. He's already taking notes. He's already, he's already <laughs> you know, he's going to be on top of this thing, let me tell you. But uh, he's better. Everyone's thinking Taylor's going to dominate outside and he can hold his own on the inside, so he's going to win the fight. Again, no, not so quick. Ramirez, he can handle himself with that jab and do what he has to do to take away your advantages or at least to to even the playing field with a boxer on the outside. Now, here's the reason why I think the line is what it is. You you beautifully, you said, you, you brought up that Taylor beat Pro Grace in his last fight. Now, in the last fight for Ramirez, it wasn't as beautiful. He, he had a tough win, again, and it was beautiful, but he had a tough win against Postal. Postal. And Postal is a very, very difficult style. And that's why the bookmakers like, like uh, Taylor. Because Postal fought him the way they think Taylor could fight him. He fought him on the outside. He, he, he's got a good jab. He uses his legs. He, he owns the outside, the parameters of the ring. Um, he's a very, very difficult style. He's awkward. He's unorthodox a little bit. There's something about his style. Like you come in two inches, he goes back three. He'll look to counter you. Uh, he knows how to control reins, uh, post style. He is not an easy out. He is not. He's a former champion. He is not a freaking easy guy to freaking deal with. And Ramirez got the win. But a lot of people... They saw some flaws in Ramirez. They said, oh, wait a minute. I guarantee you this is the reason. I'm always looking for reasons. Like, why, why in such a competitive fight, such a tight fight, why would one guy be over two to one on, on, on favorite? Why? 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 And then I said, oh, they're smart. They watched the Postal fight. They saw him give him trouble on the outside. They figured, all right, Taylor could do the same thing. Here's the difference. Even though Postal has some losses, a uh, couple, and, and Taylor's undefeated, Postal is more difficult on the outside than Taylor. His style is more difficult to deal with, where he controls range even better, where he's even more consistent at staying in that, in that geography, if you will. Where Taylor, he's good on the outside, don't get me wrong. Not as difficult as Postal because he will engage you. He will allow you to get close or he will get close to you. He, he has no problem engaging you because he knows he can fight inside. 
As I said, he could go to the body. He could, he could, and he did it with pro grace. He showed it. And that's where I think they came up with this line. They saw Postal give Ramirez trouble on the outside. They said, oh, Taylor's going to give him trouble on the outside. Taylor's not as good on the outside or as consistent on the outside as Postal. He's not. In my book, he's not. So that means Ramirez is going to be able to handle the outside and he's going to wind up getting to where he likes to be on the inside, which is not going to be a, any Sunday walk in the park either. It's not going to be a Sunday stroll because Taylor's damn good on the inside too. But that's where Ramirez wants to be. That's his place. That's his comfort zone. Let's not forget, this kid's an Olympian. Taylor was a top amateur too. So this kid was an Olympian. Let's not forget that. You know, so people that are sleeping on him, I, I think they're wrong. I think he's going to be able to, at the very least, even a playing field with his jab on the outside, not let himself be dominated. He had some trouble on the outside with Postal. He's not going to be dominated there. And he's going to get to where he wants to get to, to the promised land in his mind, to the inside. And, it, and it's going to be a hell of a fight. It's going to be a heck of a fight. And it's going to be down to all those same old, you know, things. Who wants it the most? Who's the best condition? Who's the strongest mentally? That's the main thing. Who's the strongest mentally? It's going to come down. But here's a thing for my man, Bill Krakenberger, and all the people out there in my bookie that are looking to try to get an edge, that they think that they can hang their hat on. You ready, Ken? Yep. I always talk about the geography. This is an X factor here. Uh, who gets the geography in the ring? that they want, that benefits their style, their abilities, whether it's on the inside or boxing out the uh, outside. Who gets that? Who owns that geography? This fight's about the geography, but in a different way. Not in the ring. Outside the ring. Taylor's used to fighting over there. Hi, everyone. How's the crumpets going? <laughs> He's used to fighting over there, across the pond. He's That's where... That's where not only his success has been, his comfort is with the great fans, great fans, packed, packed stadiums. Now, of course, it's just coming back now with COVID and all that stuff. But he's used to having that support. I know you're in the ring alone. Don't get me wrong. Nobody knows that better than me. You're in the ring alone. But it means something. He's used to whatever that means, to that support, that comfort of being at home in London. This fight ain't in London. It's here in Las Vegas. It's not over there. Now, I know both fighters are with the same promoter. So it's also going to come down to that. Who does Bob Arum, top rank, who does he, they want to win the most? Who do they want? Because believe me, people, listen, you get, to, you get what you get here. You get the x-ray machine. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. Sometimes, you know, you don't want to see how the sausage is made because then you're never going to eat another delicious sausage here or anymore. You don't want to know, but you're going to know here. That stuff goes on. Judges are influenced. Promoters have influence over the judges. Judges want to work. They know who's supposed to win sometimes. Yeah, I hate to break it to you guys. You know, I hate to break it to you. Make sure your kids aren't around right now, are they? Are they <laughs> no. Kids? no. All right, because I don't want to say this. Uh, I'm going to say the next thing. There's no Santa Claus. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I, and I never say that to the kids, you know, because we want to keep that faith and we want to <laughs> keep that dream and just that, that part of being a child. It's beautiful, you know. But, yeah, I hate to tell you guys, but the promoters have too much influence over the judges. The judges know who they want to win if they want to keep working. And, it, and, they're in, and believe me, the promoters have a lot to say about who works or who doesn't work. They could cross a, they could cross a guy right out. No, we don't want him. They can't say we got to have this guy, but they can say we don't want him. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. So, that unfortunately, that's one of the things that I've yelled about for years from the treetops, from the mountaintops at ESPN. Please give us a national commission. Please fix these freaking things. And I've yelled to the point where I got myself in trouble. But... Anyway, you never yell at me. It's, I can say it here. You, you, uh, you, you say, Teddy, it's okay. It's good. Come on. Let's do, let's do more of it. And the fans, too. And, and that's, that's why I'm here doing this show. But who does it comes down to, A, 
the comfort level, all the things I already broke down as far as the physical attributes of both fighters. And then it comes down to who's, how well does Taylor travel? Some guys don't travel well. How well does he travel? How comfortable will he be in Vegas in that fight where Ramirez will be comfortable? He'll be very comfortable. And both guys uh, in their home bases draw big crowds. Ramirez, Ramirez in Fresno, he's got a great story helping the farmers with the, water, uh, with the water effort and all that stuff. Great story. And Taylor, great over there with the huge, huge amounts of people. So Aaron could go over there and promote over there, no doubt about it, and make money over there. And he could promote right here in the, in the U, USFA. He could promote right here with Ramirez and, and he could do the same thing, bring big crowds now that the COVID's over. So who does he want to win? So that's going to come down to, that's going to be part of it. Who does Aram, yeah, yeah, who do they want to win more? I'm going to say Ramirez with the great Latino following and everything else and everything. And again, Taylor's got a great following with you guys over there. He does, you know, now that you're choking on your crumpets that I'm, I'm going down a road <laughs> that you probably didn't want me to go down. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sip that tea. I'm sorry, but uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's Aram probably wants Ramirez more maybe, and at the end of the day, here's my pick: a split decision win for Ramirez, and maybe controversial, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Everything in box is controversial anyway, Ken. But <laughs> a split decision win for Ramirez, and I'm sorry, I still love you. I'm sorry I couldn't bring you better news over across the pond after the Billy Joel. You're, you're, waiting, you're waiting to get good news this week. You had to go through that and suffer through the Billy Joel uh, Saunders fight last week, and now you, you, know, you wanted to recuperate a little bit, right? And you, and you figure, okay, we'll recuperate. We're going to get it back with Taylor. No, 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 guys, no. I'm sorry. But you still <laughs> got thoughts. You still got snooker, like I said earlier. And um, we still love you. We still love you. And oh my God, if I'm wrong about this one, Ken, we might have to take a week off. We might have to take a week off. Cancel the show. (laughs) (laughs) We don't do that. We don't hide. We will show up. We'll We'll be be here here next week. We'll be here. So if you like the pick, head on over to mybookie.ag, use the promo code ATLAS, and get your bets in on Jose Ramirez at plus 210. Of course, by the time this comes out, once they found out Krakenberger's on Ramirez, you're probably going to be laying money on Ramirez. Yeah, you might be. He's the man. He moves lines. (laughs) He moves lines. No doubt. Hey, before we sign off real quick, I just want to get your thoughts. They, they allegedly have, I, I feel like we've mentioned this like a hundred times, but now they officially, officially announced Fury Joshua heading to Saudi Arabia, August 14th. We'll do a thorough breakdown. We'll get in the ring. We'll do a yeah, fight course. plan. We'll give it the full treatment. This is going to be the biggest fight in many years, especially with the COVID coming on the heels of COVID. Curious to see what they do with fans, et cetera, et cetera. Any initial thoughts to the official announcement? Well, my man Billy's going to tell us the line already. The line's up already. Give us the line, Billy. I'm actually surprised to see how low it is. I, I just thought Fury would be a bigger favorite, but maybe it's just my brain thinking that because of, because of I've seen Fury in action and uh, I've seen Joshua lose. Um, so uh, minus 165. I thought it would be more like a 2-1 to one favorite. So Fury's the favorite. Fury's the favorite, minus 165. Value on Fury. Wow. Well, you know, I just thought it'd be a little bit more. So Fury, yeah, so only 165, minus 165 Fury uh, over Joshua. So that's what it is right now. Um, do you expect that line to, to change? Uh? Uh, there'll be Fury money coming in. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I would wait if you want to take Josh, Joshua. I would wait. Uh, but if you want to jump on the favorite, I would jump on him now. I think there'll be more money coming on Fury. Uh, uh, and, and the same thing with the, the Conor McGregor fight. Oh, you know, always fan favorites. You always want to uh, jump on them uh, ahead of time. And if you're on the dog, you want to wait until like, all the fans come in and pack the casinos and start betting the favorites in, uh, in volume. So there it is. There it is for the man himself. If you, if you yeah. guys out there want to go to my bookie and you like Fury, do it now. Do it now because um, build things that a lot of... A lot of uh, a lot of money will come in on him, and uh, 
it'll make the line larger than it is right now. So yep. I, listen, we're not going to break the fight down now. We've got plenty of time to do that. Uh, but $155 million uh, given from somebody in Saudi Arabia to put the fight over there as a site fee. That's that's a lot of... Uh, that's a lot of shillings. Uh, that's uh, that's that's a lot of uh, talking to our friends across the pond. That's quite a few shillings there. Uh, that's that's a lot of money. Can you imagine just for the site fee? Just for the site fee, what was it? One hundred fifty-five, I think. One hundred fifty-five that, million. That, that's what I'm hearing. That that's yeah. what I'm hearing. But I'm sorry, but I can't help thinking in the back of my head. Like I wonder if they're gonna allow um, certain journalists in to cover the fight. I wonder if Washington Post will be able to send anyone over to Saudi Arabia, and if maybe this huge site fee might serve as a bit of a distraction from some of the controversy that Saudi Arabia has been involved with with uh, journalism. You're on a button, Ken. They, the countries, the people that run the country, they pay that money for a reason, to either help with tourism or to help with politics, to help with relations, to, to help with something. That's why they're paying the money. I mean, it's not just to have a private party with, with the sheiks <laughs> over there. You know, I mean, I know they got a lot of money, but, but there, there's, other, there's other purpose behind it. There are. 100%. And, you know, 100%. And, and now, it's nice to and it's nice to own an oil well or two. It's nice. It's 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 nice to own a few oil wells, right, Bill? I mean, it's 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 nice, and it, it's and I guess they're happy with what our guys over here are doing, pushing up the the, the damn uh, gas prices where they're going <laughs> higher and higher. So they're they're only gonna have more money now. They're they're only gonna have more money. Uh, but you know, but I I uh, I digress. Um, but. I will tell you, there's a precedent. There's a precedent for this kind of maneuvering with countries. Um, years and years ago, Don King was probably the first guy. He, if not the first, definitely right up there. But he might have been the first guy to be smart enough to go to countries to get them to put up money for site fees, because he went to the dictator, bad guy, but he went to the dictator what was his name Mugab uh, Mugobi uh, yeah Mugabe he went to him uh, years ago to make the Ali Foreman fight over in Zaire he went to him to get money and of, unfortunately the guy's a bad guy he's a dictator uh, but he had you know he meanwhile he had these poor people in that country living in uh in poverty but meanwhile he's he's given don king uh what was it 10 million dollars i think at that time and that was huge i know that sounds like nothing now that's uh, that's like what you what you tip the guy to valet your car but i mean <laughs> that you know that's that's nothing. yeah but it's how much to change the how much to change the perception of your country or or, or at exactly least slightly right, influence Ken. like oh there's that's a lot of bad things for. going on here here's a couple bucks can we host a big event and maybe people stop talking about it and that's the point that we're making here that's the point. That's the genesis of that. That's that's the motivation, the incentive for a country to put up $155 million and for a dictator in his country years ago to put up $10 million, which was never, 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 never done before. Um, that That's the incentive. That's the reason to change the perception, whether it was for the dictator himself because of his ego and because of whatever, or whether it's to bring people over or whether it's to, you know, to, as you just said uh, to to mend fences with a country with a with a government uh politically whatever it is but it's it's that's that's serving right now for the money to be there that is the reason why that kind of money uh is there and it's extraordinary and the fight's going to happen and these guys are probably going to make at least 75 million dollars each Right? Oh, I, 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 mean, I would imagine. I, I mean, it's probably going to go south of that, but but or north of that, whatever it is. North, I, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I, I get confused. They, north, the south. Fighters you're, the will get the you're the financial guy. You're the <laughs> one who, who has to give me a compass when it comes to that stuff. North is up, to, south is down. You're, you're the one who has to help me there, Ken. You're leaving me out there. But um, should make a, The fighters should make a lot of money on this one. This should be the biggest, uh, biggest payday in boxing. By and, far. Yeah. And the pay-per-view, imagine what the pay-per-view is going to do. Uh, wow. Global pay-per-view. Uh, but again, uh, 
these fighters won't have to worry about the things that uh, most of us worry about every day <laughs> nope. after this fight, you know. Uh, and I always say, you know, even though it gets crazy with these numbers, and I was, I'll be consistent. I'll say what I always say. For me, well, I always take the side of the fighters. They can't get paid enough because yep. you never know. You never know. Because as I've said for years on ESPN, every time a fighter gets in a ring, he comes out of that ring with less of himself. Yep. You just don't know how much less. That's the only thing you don't know. So God bless them. Let them get as much money as they can. And uh, it, it will be a spectacle. It will be a, uh, it will be a worldwide event. It will be a worldwide event. Yep, and with that, Teddy, let me remind people, if you'd like to hear more from Teddy, um, his audio book is available on Audible. Check it out at audible.com. Um, you can also get a personal video message from Teddy on Cameo. Go to cameo.com, search Teddy Atlas. And I know everyone's excited for the Box Raw 36-minute collection coming out very soon, probably in June, right? Uh, Box yeah. Raw's got a line of Teddy Atlas apparel coming out. And finally, if you'd like some, per, like some boxing in, instructional videos, head over to Dynamic Striking and check out the videos on offer there. There's some actually really good stuff there, especially if you're getting introduced to the sport and want some, um, an introduction to some of the techniques involved, in particular, the 14 different types of jabs. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Yeah, and uh, My pleasure. And for all great fans over there across the pond, uh, you guys can get it too if you like it you know marcus <laughs> of queensbury it all started with you guys it yep. all started with you guys i don't forget that i never forget that and i will not out of love for you and respect for you i will no longer talk about saunders i will no longer talk about uh how ramirez is going to win this fight and you get good value at two to one i'm not going to talk about that no more and i'm not not going to put butter on my crumpets nope <laughs> nope, I'm not clotted, clotted cream only. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go have some tea, Ken. Come on. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate you as always, and uh, look for the Dustin Poirier interview later in the week. Take care. <laughs>